this lunch hour series on the 3rd of October, and we're at both Conservative and Labour conferences where, apart from other things, we're doing events on race, on Brexit regret. We have an in-conversation with Wes Streeting and an in-conversation with Lee Anderson. That's chalk and cheese for you. Anyway, without further ado, Yannicka and Joel, do one of you want to kick us off? I think that'll be me, yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I'm going to sort of, you know, give a quick introduction to the report, and I think kind of the main question really is why, why have we written this, why have we written this now? After all, the TCA review clause, Article 776, is, uh, you know, one sentence in a thousand plus page report, and it doesn't apply for another two to three years. So why have we gone to this effort to spill out 40 pages on it now? Um, the reason really is that we've seen detected an increasing amount of conversation within UK politics about this idea of the TCA review in 2025 or 2026 as being an opportunity for a political reset in the UK EU relationship and that it might be a moment on which to build on the current TCA by adding new elements which uh, smooth out some of the trade frictions which a TCA has created and um, most notably the Labour Party has um, been advocating using the review in this way. Over the summer, David Lammy talked about a number of different agreements on uh, veterinary standards, mutual recognition of professional qualifications, conformity assessments, mobility agreements, all this kind of stuff. And then uh, just last, uh, oh, yesterday or Saturday, Sunday, as we obviously knew Keir Starmer was gonna come out and make this big intervention where he says, the TCA review, that's the moment for me. And uh, yeah, this is when we're gonna do all these things. Um, so really what we're trying to add to this conversation is a question of, of feasibility. Like these are the arguments on the UK side, but what is the thinking in Brussels and what are the practical and structural constraints on what you can actually do with this review clause? So there's the process and there's the politics. Um, on the process, kind of the key thing which we're putting across is this review clause is really, really vague. It doesn't prescribe anything in particular. It doesn't commit to any specific results. And normally when the EU has this clause in an agreement, it's just a technical thing which you sign off after five years and you say, OK, yeah, we've looked at it. It's functioning broadly as inspected. It's just about the implementation. It's not about renegotiation. Um, and so if you want to make it something more, if the UK wants to make the review something more ambitious, it needs the EU to agree to that. That's the crucial point. And that then brings in the politics, which is how do you get the EU to agree to that? Because as Yannicka is about to sort of elucidate, um, there's not really much appetite in Brussels at the moment. So if the UK is going to want a more ambitious review in 2025-26, which would be out of the ordinary for these kind of review clauses, uh, it's going to have to think really carefully about how it incentivizes the EU to come to the table and how it actually structures that process as well. Do you actually need a review or could you just sort of work through problems, issues as they come along in a more ad hoc manner? So those are kind of the big questions which we're trying to raise in this report. And I'll hand over to Yannicka. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joel, uh, and hi, everyone. Um, so as Joel has just outlined, there are kind of two factors that we look at in the report. One is process, how could the TCA review unfold, and the other is politics. Um, I'm going to quickly give you an overview of the three models um, that we introduce in the report. Um, so in the report, uh, what we're saying is that the EU and the UK can decide to either examine, to exploit, or to expand the TCA. Um, the first one would be the minimalist version, examine the TCA. So this would be a light touch stock take um, as part of existing reporting duties. Um, both sides already publish implementation reports uh, annually or biannually uh, in, in which they summarize the overall functioning of the institutional framework, uh, sectoral implementation issues and so on, but with no ambition to change the agreement. So this approach is probably the one that's most in line with the EU's current interpretation of the review. Um, the second model, uh, the exploit review, uh, would seek to realize the TCA's full potential um, by acting on as yet unfulfilled commitments that are in the treaty and or by improving its governance structures. So this could turn out to be a fairly limited exercise. They could, for example, tweak how some of the specialized committees work or they could set up some of the regular dialogues um, that are provided for in the TCA. But it could also be more wide ranging uh, and for inst instance involve the linking of the emission trading schemes, which is encouraged by the TCA. 
Um, there's of course no need to wait for the review to fully exploit what's already in the TCA, um, but it could theoretically become a focal point for discussions for both sides. Uh, the last uh, model that um, we look at is the expand uh, model. Uh, just to be clear, this is not a wholesale or this would not be a wholesale renegotiation of the TCA. Um, our report finds that quite unlikely given that red lines on both sides haven't really changed. But the parties could decide to add new elements which are not foreseen by the treaty. So things like a veterinary deal, a use mobility deal and so on. Um, this would, of course, require political buy-in from both sides uh, and potentially a new mandate for the European Commission to negotiate on behalf of member states. Um, and depending on the scope of negotiations, these supplementing agreements could take a long time to finalise. Um, I want to move on and say a few words on feasibility on those three models. Um, so we, of course, know that Kistama said um, that he wants to use the scheduled review to seek a closer trading relationship. Um, but we find in the report that there are significant barriers to using the review in this way. Uh, and the main one is really that the EU is showing little appetite for using the TCA to renegotiate uh, the agreement. And commission officials see this as a light touch stock take very much in line with the examine model that I just outlined. There are several reasons for that. Um, the first one is that the EU sees the TCA as a very good deal. Uh, the agreement was carefully negotiated to balance the interests of 27 member states, um, and there's little appetite to reopen it and risk upsetting this. Um, after years of really difficult negotiations, there's also a strong sense of Brexit fatigue in Brussels. And on top of that, um, EU leaders have more pressing issues to deal with. So if you think about the war in Ukraine, enlargement, uh, the green and digital transformations, those topics have long replaced Brexit on their list of priorities. Um, there's also still a lack of trust in the UK and the EU will be hesitant to engage in negotiations unless it believes that future governments will uphold whatever is agreed. So for all of these reasons, uh, the EU is at the moment very much focused on implementation of the existing agreements. Uh, so the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement, which are still in their early stages. Um, and the incentives for the EU to return to the negotiating table are currently quite low. Um, so any future UK government that wants to build on the agreement will have to think about these factors, process, how to best achieve those things, but more importantly, the balance of interests between what the UK wants and what the EU might want. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Oh, you're on mute, Anand. Sorry, I'm new to this technology. Uh, Stella, can I turn to you next? And just for your thoughts on what you've just heard and whether you think Keir Starmer and his team have thought through some of these issues that Yannicka and Joel have raised. And can I start by thanking Yannicka and Joel for, for their work? Uh, not least because as chair of the Labour movement for Europe, it has felt like a little bit of a lonely furrow to be ploughing, wanting to talk about what could be possible in 2025, 26. And so I'm very grateful for people with much more thought and diligence and patience than I have working through a number of these issues. And I think it's a very clear report and a clear set out of some of the challenges ahead. Let me offer you three reflections on what they've said and I hope will shape some of the conversation we can have. Um, they are absolutely right. This is ultimately about the political conversation, because in anything, no deal is done until it is done. So absolutely, it is right to start talking now about what could be achieved in 2025, because it will take a long time to address a number of the underlying currents that they talked about, and particularly this issue of trust. Uh, I've often compared the United Kingdom to being like that horrible man that your aunt married, and for 20 years you had to put up with him at Christmas, finally she's divorced him you're not going to invite him back for easter you know as much as you've spent a lot of your life with him we have a lot of work to do to repair not just the damage that was done during the referendum and post the referendum but since and i think when you look at the tca it is a terrible deal for this country and we're seeing that play out in the consequences for businesses and the consequences for security and the consequences for our energy policy every single day uh, British consumers and British citizens are seeing the impact of the deal that was done 
for Brexit. But my first observation is none of that means that we can't aim high for what could happen in 2025 if we start to put the work in now. And I think that's what you're seeing today with Keir and Rachel in France with the conversations that they've been having, start to say, actually, we're really serious about this. And to take on that challenge that that is about more than trust, but trust really, really matters. Um, we are just a year away since we had a prime minister who couldn't decide whether the French were friend or foe and rightly was outlived by a lettuce. The UK standing on the world stage has been irreparably damaged and there's going to be a lot of work to be done to tackle that. Uh, but secondly, I do take up the challenge that Yannick and Joel put out about, well, frankly, for the European nations involved in this, is it worth the effort? Uh, I would also point to the rise of the far right around Europe and the challenge that that may create in terms of doing politics uh, in the coming years. Um, the As you talk about Brexit fatigue, um, that just that sense of, well, what actually do you want to achieve? And that's why I think it's really important that we are clearer earlier on that you're right, it's not just about trust, it is also about the forward motion. I think that also helps for British politics because one of the things that we need to get over is the idea that there are Remainers and Brexiteers. We left the European Union in 2019. Remain is not on the agenda because it is a 10, 20 year project that would require more referendums. And frankly, what we're dealing with is British businesses and business jobs that will go to the wall within the next couple of years. Um, and that's really my, my final third question about all of this and what I think should shape our conversation from now on because if we are to ask our European partners to put time and effort and energy into this and if we are to put the time and effort and energy of government into this um, I we don't believe in the Labour Movement of Europe that you can make Brexit work but we do believe that you can solve the problems and one of the things I think that your report scopes out very well is that actually only dealing with the TCA as it currently stands probably doesn't generate enough of a return for all the energy and input that that would require. So our challenge now as a movement and the work that we're doing is, you know, kind of go big or go home. What are the things that we need to be working towards being able to deliver in 2025 through this process that actually can have a meaningful impact on the challenges that our businesses, that our consumers, that our country is seeing as a result of Brexit? Let me just give you some examples of that. Absolutely, people have talked about a veterinary deal and we're already seeing the government admit that the plans they have for the border will lead to higher inflation and trying to delay those plans. So clearly we need to resolve some of those issues. Um, I'm very conscious Peter is here and he will tell you that alignment is an access, but certainly alignment shows willing to be able to solve some of those problems and I hope would lead to our capacity to really tackle the impact that's having on British farming. Uh, we in the Labour Movement for Europe are very interested in the pan-European Mediterranean Convention and the possibilities that that might offer for tackling the rules of origin challenges that we can see that are absolutely decimating uh, British manufacturers. And we also think that there is a very clear debate to be had about reforming our visa system. That's not just about youth mobility. Uh, it's not just about our creative industries. We can see a lot of service sectors where already... Uh, people are losing out jobs because they don't have an EU passport, where businesses are starting to relocate that slow puncture. People always said that Brexit would be. It wasn't that people's jobs would move overseas immediately. It's that as businesses, as organisations were starting to make decisions, then clearly they were going to relocate to the 550 million consumers on their doorstep because you can fight many things in life, but you can't fight geography. Um, all of those are challenges ahead for a political movement that has said it wants to secure the fastest growth of the G7 if it's lucky enough to win the next election. And let me be clear, you can, of course, aim to get the fastest growth outside of your relationship with Europe. But that's like saying that you can tie your shoelaces without using your hands. If you use your hands, it's an awful lot easier. So clearly, and today, a very clear statement of intent from Rachel and Keir being in France, starting those discussions, we in the Labour Movement for Europe are really interested in how we can use that time to maximal effect, because ultimately we're not sure British business has the time to wait that would be required for this not to be a maximal uh, solution. That frankly, if you are a business now facing the reams and reams of paperwork and the com complications that Brexit has caused, all the delays at the border, all those issues in your supply chain, you need to know that an incoming Labour government will be ruthless in prioritising what can be done immediately to assist you. Uh, my plan is for us to be the Reds against red tape. And on that moment, I will stop and hand over to Peter, I'm sure, who's got some strong ideas about how we could achieve that.
Peter, just before I turn to you, let me say Peter has just written a book about Brexit called What Went Wrong with Brexit. Uh, we should be posting the link in the Slido now. Whilst not as free as our superb report, it is a very good read and actually quite reasonably priced, albeit not free. Peter. It's a bargain, Ellen's. Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. I, I, um, it's very good the uh, the report uh, uh, that uh, Joel and Yannick have done, and it points to all of the limitations of the process that begins in 2026. I guess what I'd say is um, there is a slight danger that we judge what is possible by um, by precedent, by what is happening now in in the in the EU. Um, you know, it's not surprising that. Um, you know, European capitals and Brussels, you know, that the message is pretty tepid. They've got other things to worry about. And, uh, you know, after 10 years, it will be in 2026 of bruising negotiations with the UK. They're going to need some pretty good reasons to rethink uh, um, the wider approach to the relationship with the EU, with the UK, which, of course, has been adversarial, zero sum. Uh, you know, this basic narrative that the UK is going to prosper by divergence and running off and doing its own thing. I think, you know, there is a year, assuming that Starmer wins in, in the autumn of 2024, there is a, effectively a year's run up to the TCA implementation. Uh, it is clear that it's, an, it's, a, it's a, an implementation review, not a renegotiation. But in that year, there are things I think that Starmer can do to signal that he wants a much uh, more uh, neighbourhood based relationship with the EU, which will which will be important in engaging capitals. Um, you know, the linking of carbon scheme, you know, if you think of where we have shared uh, ambitions, so we've done a join the North Sea Wind Power Cooperation uh, Agreement, you know, linking the ETS schemes, the UK carbon currently just trading at a 40 euro discount is a quite serious material concrete step to saying that we see this as a neighbourhood problem. There are things we can offer in that regard, for example, North Sea, uh, empty North Sea oil wells for carbon and capture sequestration. The EU just doesn't have that stuff in their geography. Linking the ETS scheme, there is a clause about that in the TCA. Some people in the EU say you need a separate legal agreement, and it took, it took the Swiss 10 years to do their agreement. I don't think it would take us 10 years, and I think it would be an important statement of intent. Similarly, on mobility, if Labour wants a youth mobility scheme, it's another offer that we have that, um, you know, European young people, European elites want for their young people. Now, the British government has been going around European capitals trying to get mobility deals. The Commission has basically been telling member states to hold off, and partly because they look at the health surcharges and they just see what they feel is a kind of British attempt to use European young people as cheap labour with poor social security benefits. You know, that is the kind of agreement that whilst it will have to be done, I think, legally bilaterally, I don't think youth mobility deals can be done at commission level. It may well be done with an umbrella agreement that sets out terms of equal treatment. And obviously, mobility deal doesn't give you residency, but the UK is going to have to be clear that at some level they're prepared to buy into the neighbourhood. The Erasmus scheme is another one, something that Boris Johnson dropped, which you know, unlike the Turing scheme, which is the student scheme, which is a one way ticket out of the UK, but nothing reciprocal. Erasmus is reciprocal. It was used more by EU students than UK ones. But it's about being prepared to pay into that for the wider good. We saw with the negotiation on Horizon just passed that the Treasury, you know, as one official put it, didn't want to put 15 billion euros in to get 13 billion euros out. But at some level, you know, bean counting aside, the UK is going to have to be really clear that it intends to um, you know, prime the pump, as it were, of a future negotiation. I think on a lot of the trade stuff, it's going to be a long burn, but you've got to start somewhere. And the danger with the kind of defeatist approach, which is it's all going to be really complicated, iterative and slow, is that that then builds a narrative that it's not worth doing. And I think what you have to do is ask yourself where if you you know, take this foreign office view, which is around at the moment that, you know, the first term of a Labour government will be Labour learning to get disillusioned with Brussels and will end up in Sunak 2.0. I think, you know, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy quite quickly. But actually, 
the boiling of the frog, the application of local anaesthetic to, you know, the chronic problem that, you know, Brexit is adding to our, our headwinds on investment on productivity uh, it would be a huge mistake. You know, it, and even if, well, this would be my last point, even if we're not rejoining the single market and the customs union, and we, we find it, you know, politically too difficult to tackle any of the closer level of alignments, including dynamic alignment on a load of sectors, maybe uh, with a kind of statutory element, a kind of reverse retained EU law bill as a way of putting a floor under the future negotiation. Even if that doesn't get us anywhere, that is an incredibly important process in returning the UK to fact-based policymaking. Because when you talk to investors and outsiders, you know, the UK now has an element of political risk about it. For a long time, the UK attracted foreign direct investment because it was a stepping stone, a platform into Europe. It had strong regulatory apparatus and it had, you know, the rule of law, the time zones, but a dependable political apparatus that survived political cycles. And we need to get that back. And even if we're not going to go back into Europe anytime soon, we need to get back a really clear offer about where the UK sees its place in the world. And that is, you know, a lot of that stuff can be done at home. I mean, one of the problems we have, for example, in a post-Brexit world is that even where we have ambition, we don't yet have the regulators and the regulatory capacity to deliver that ambition on medical devices, on gene editing, on all that good science superpower stuff you hear ministers going on about. We need land, we need skills, we need uh, uh, transport networks in cities. None of that is actually to do with Brexit, but confronting the, you know, the frankly kind of the six years of madness of pinball policymaking is is absolutely fundamental to the Labour Party, if it is the Labour Party, or a future Tory government that has less Brexit baggage in creating an offer for the UK, whether we're inside the with EU or, or without it. And that is why, notwithstanding all of the difficulties uh, um, that the report outlines, it's actually a process worth doing, but it will take political courage political leadership and political stamina. Thank you. Uh, Joel or uh, Yannicka, do either of you want to come back to anything you've heard so far? You can say no. Oh, Yannicka, you go first. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll have a start. Lots of things to come back onto, so I, I don't know where to start. Um, I think the first one, uh, the first point I wanted to say something on is um, the importance of rebuilding trust um, and um, rebuilding bilateral relationships. And um, Stella spoke about Keir Starmer's visit to France and kind of the, the significance of that. Um, and I guess my thoughts on that uh, yes, it's important to invest in bilateral relations and to rebuild trust, and particularly with France, where the relationship has been under a lot of strain because of Brexit. Um, and one thing that we've seen um, also with this government is that um, they've, over the past couple of years, they've signed a lot of bilateral agreements with most EU member states. Um, and it's now going to be a question of how do you invest resources and time to actually give practical meaning to those agreements, most of which are actually non-binding. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that um, trust building also needs to happen at the level of the EU and the EU institutions, um, because um, the bilateral agreements that you have with member states are only limited in scope. Um, and member states can't um, do anything with the UK in areas where the EU has exclusive competence or in areas that are uh, covered by the withdrawal agreement or the trade and cooperation agreement. And um, at the end of the day, it is the commission um, that, um, you, that, that is in charge of the specialized committees and the partnership council and kind of manage, manages the day-to-day -day relationship. So I think uh, it's going to be quite vital to rebuild trust at that level as well um so that's one point um and then on kind of the 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 wider trajectory um i agree that the eu is interested in good relations with the uk and and good mute music 
um, and that they're interested in realizing the full potential of the TCA. That's something they've actually said repeatedly. Um, but I think um, there is, it is going to be difficult for the UK to incentivize the EU to focus on the relationship at a political level and at a level where you, if you want to add onto the agreement in areas that are not currently foreseen, I think that's going to be quite a challenge because the EU has other priorities and is distracted. And is, there is a preference on the EU side for now managing the relationship through the more technical governance structures that the TCA provides rather than having the political level come back in, which we've seen over the past few years with the Windsor framework, where you needed kind of intervention, interventions from Rishi Sunak and von der Leyen. So I think for the EU, because there is now a focus on other things, on future member states rather than a former member, um, it's going to be, to be difficult to, to kind of ask the EU to invest resource uh, and time and focus into the relationship. So I think there is still this question for the UK, how do you incentivize the EU to come to the negotiating table and what is of interest to the EU? And um, I think that's going to be quite difficult in those trading areas in particular, because the deal uh, works quite well for the EU. It's mainly uh, It mainly covers trade in goods where the EU has a trade surplus with the UK um, and the EU might be more interested in, in kind of areas like foreign and security policy, youth mobility, cultural exchanges. But even there, as Peter said, with the uh, youth mobility deals, uh, it's going to be more complicated than that. So I think there still needs to be more thinking on the on the UK side on how you can incentivize the EU and how you can kind of grab their attention if you if you want to actually build on the deal. Joel, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just um, kind of think I'm aware that kind of what we're saying is slightly characterised as we're saying a TCA, a big TCA review is more trouble than it's worth for the government. And actually, it's going to be really, really hard. But it's actually like if you dig into the details of the report, it is more nuanced than that. I think what we're also saying is if you have the ambitions that the Labour Party seems to have, there is more than one way of reaching that point where you have a closer technical alignment with the EU and kind of this notion of the 2025 review is it's like a simplistic way of looking at the end goal and actually probably you need to think more in terms of the steps that you take to get there. And um, probably this is a relationship that is already on an upwards trajectory in terms of the warmth of the relationship compared to where it was under David Frost and Boris Johnson. Rishi Sunak has, has warmed relations a bit. And so if you want to take things further in that direction of having more kind of supplementing agreements added onto this deal, you need to move in baby steps. Um, and so first of all, in terms of earning that trust, I think a first challenge for the UK will be, um, you know, firstly implementing things that is actually said that it will do and which it hasn't yet done, i.e. border checks on goods coming in from the EU, implementing all the systems needed to make the Windsor framework work. Unless those things are in place, why would the EU consider listening to the UK about anything else? And then you have kind of these secondary questions of, okay, is it worth trying to have a big negotiation where we package up five or six deals and we say, we want mobility, we want SPS, we want professional qualifications? Or do you have to be a bit more strategic about how you go about things? Because potentially if you put it all in together, you might jam up the system with lots of complex negotiations. Um, do you kind of, you know, it's a jargony phrase, but do you go for the lowest hanging fruit? Do you decide on what your number one priorities are as a government? And perhaps you don't need to focus on this review as a big way of getting everything you want, but you move the dial slowly but surely. And also, I suppose, thinking long term about the direction of UK politics, um, I think there's been a shift since Sunak came in where we've stopped really talking about divergence and Brexit opportunities so much, and we've moved more towards uh, alignment in order to minimise disruption to business. And for a government which wants to continue going in that direction, there's perhaps an incentive to slowly embed those norms, incrementally take steps, rather than going for the, the big boom 2025, 26 moment, which is potentially more difficult to do and uh, politically potentially more explosive as well. So it's about other ways of framing how, how this relationship could evolve. Peter. I agree with absolutely all of that from Joel, I think uh, um, with a caveat, but I think he's absolutely right that the way the British media reports Europe and the way we're kind of trained to think about these negotiations is kind of cliff edges, no deal, last minute, standoff, 2019, OK, Corral, etc. 
the deal is done now. None of those pressures, the Windsor framework is there, the TCA is there. This will be a slow and iterative process. I guess what I would say is that, that somewhere there needs to be a sweet spot between accepting that this is a different category of negotiation whilst at the same time maintaining momentum. Because one of the things that's just really not understood about Brexit as a thing, which you really get when you talk to manufacturers and you talk to industry, is that it gets harder over time. So this idea that you can anaesthetize the problem by just doing a bit of sectoral alignment is, you know, misses the fact that actually, unless you do really quite difficult stuff and, and linking the ETS, the carbon schemes, is a really significant stop. It will basically mean the UK outsourcing a lot of its net zero policy making levers to the European Union or pooling them with the European Union. There'll be stick about rule taking. But unless you do some quite fundamental things to address the kind of the stuff that Joel does so well in his divergence tracker, this passive divergence iceberg problem, then you're 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 kind of just shadowing, you're just ushering on the slow puncture. But at some level, you've got to think about ways in which you reverse the ratchet. And that probably means not sinking into an iterative negotiation, but actually taking some rather bolder steps than certainly currently are being advertised by the by the Labour leadership. Although they may yet get there, we'll see. I mean, what, what I don't get about this debate, I think, I mean, Stella, you talked about Labour aiming high and Peter you're a bit sniffy about the bean counters but I'm going to be a bean counter here is all the sort of stuff that's being talked about is economically quite trivial isn't it I mean if you want to stop the slow puncture you join the single market if you don't join the single market you have a slow puncture the rest is nice it's trimmings you know Erasmus will let middle class kids go to Provence for a year uh, mutual recognition of qualifications will let middle class professionals go and work in continental Europe a bit more easily but in the greater scheme of things, if you're really talking about growth, none of these things are really going to move the dial, are they? So we're we're sort of we're nibbling at the edges of the big issue here. And surely then it is a reasonable question. If none of these things are really going to move the dial in terms of economic growth, if they, they might change the mood music, uh, and there might be some purpose that I'm yet to be convinced in a security deal, why put so much political capital, time and effort in a first term where God knows Keir Starmer's intray is going to be overflowing into doing this. So should I? I yep. I, look, I mean, anyone is welcome that's, to disagree with me. That's, no, that's exactly why we're saying this has to be meaningful to be worth the effort. But this is also the point at which I bring in my Moldova card, because we think that actually one of the things that's missing from a UK debate and it, I think reflects some of the stuff that Peter's been talking about our our narrative about relationships with Brussels and if we're honest this goes back way past the previous this current government current prime minister previous prime minister previous prime minister but one um, has always been about conflict it's always been about hostility it's almost been about the immediacy and actually frankly what the Windsor agreement shows is that if you treat people like grown-ups you can achieve a lot more than people thought was possible What's happening in Moldova now with the EU trade facilitation agreement shows that the idea that it is all or nothing for Europe just isn't the case. There is a lot more flexibility, a lot more willingness to look at what can be done if there is a mutual interest. And I think that goes back to Yannicka's point, which is how do we show in the next year and a half that there is mutual benefit here for the EU to work with the UK in a number of fields? And we've talked a bit about trade, there's clearly benefits to security cooperation. There's also clearly benefits when it comes to climate cooperation. And particularly, as you said, I'm, we've always been a big fan of the North Sea Energy Co-op, Peter, because it helps everybody reduce the cost of renewables because it's about the sea between us. Um, so we think there are a number of areas where you can show there is mutual benefit, which I think do answer Anand's call that it's got to be worth the effort and energy, because you're right, this will take a considerable amount of government time. But let me also just put some counterfactuals to you. Look, frankly, this government, this current government is already investing quite a bit of time behind the scenes into some of these issues. Mm -hmm. So some of those challenges, I think we will be much further ahead by the time we get to a general election. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to take any lectures from the current government about Brexit when they're putting plumbers and builders on the visa shortage list, because everything they told people about what Brexit would deliver just hasn't 
materialise. But what I am going to do is agree with you that if we are going to go again and try and rebuild that relationship, there has to be benefit on both sides and it has to be meaningful for the economic challenges that we are facing because the impact of Brexit is only going to become more and more apparent. We already know it's hit the cost of living. We know it's hitting the cost of our supply chains. And um, we think that there are benefits in setting out what kind of deal we would want to do around what bits of the single market we might want to access. And we could look at accessing in the immediate term. And I go back to particularly that window. What I'm particularly worried about is all those industries who just haven't got the 10 years of long lengthy negotiations to wait already even you know the creative industries i think is our fourth largest ex area of exports already all those people skilled in technicians and all it's not just about the artists it's not just about whether or not you can see elton john in belgium it's about the fact that all those creative skilled technicians are already retraining in italy in france so actually for those major companies unless mm. we do something substantial about these issues within the next couple of years they'll all have relocated anyway and actually it'll have very little impact there is a benefit an economic benefit in being bold but there's also a practicality about it because if you are the eu you're right and then well you know tinkering around the edges isn't really worth their time either what i'm also saying is i think the political debate has moved on so i mean we've polled the british public and there is a massive amount of support for example for having a visa system that recognizes you've got a job to go to either in the uk or in, in europe you should be able to do that without the penalties that we're seeing people facing now and um, those debates those conversations need to start happening now because it will take even on a, an immediate term it will take several years to rebuild that trust and show that we're serious about finding a deal that works for everyone i just i look at what's happening in moldova i look at the windsor agreement and i think there is cause to be hopeful that if we approach europe as serious credible trust trustworthy people who don't look for conflict but look for consensus quite a lot more could be achieved and that would be in their interest and also be in the british economy's interest Okay. I mean, hopeful is not a state of mind I'm familiar with, but uh, anyone else want to come back on this question? Well, well, it's not because you're a fan of Tottenham Hotspur. Um, <laughs> what, what's the alternative? I'd throw the question back to you. What's the upside in doing nothing? What are you going to do? So, you, so you're not going to really bother engaging with Europe because it's a waste of time. You're not going to bother trying fixing the obvious problems of TCA so that you can do what? And where do you think that leaves us in five years' time? Well, I think if... If both parties are excluding single market and customs union membership, then you are reconciling yourself to the economic impacts of Brexit. They're a given. Uh, so in that case, you focus on domestic economic policies, I suppose. I mean, what I'm saying is that, you know, if you really think this is... At which, point, at which point you'll find yourself getting back to... Because so it seems to me if we end up doing a load of rule taking, the obvious question is, well, we don't have a seat at the table. So the next step to that is, OK, well, how do we get a seat at the table? So it seems to me it, it's, the, it's the bottom of an escalator, right? If you accept the political realities as outlined, you know, I never believe what politicians really say in their manifesto. The question to my mind is where, where the journey takes you. You're really yeah. saying it's not worth embarking on the journey. I'm saying that it is. OK, hang on. I'm gonna, Joel, I'm going to let you come in because me and Peter can squabble anytime we like. Really. <laughs> uh, yeah, this sounds like a podcast in the making. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, kind of one of the, key things is that the, the economic impact of Brexit is not a static picture and we should be careful about not just talking in this context about everything which has come before but we also need to think about what might come ahead because what we've seen where Brexit has impacted most negatively on the economy has often been in exacerbating other unforeseen challenges whether that be Covid, whether that be the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis. Britain has had it worse because of uh, a more disrupted level of connection to uh, the single market in the European continent. And so I think there's also, in terms of thinking about where the relationship goes and where you can build stronger ties, it's important to anticipate what will be to come. And so I would say that climate and energy really stand out as areas where, okay, fine, maybe now the economic benefit is relatively minimal, but that can um, extrapolate itself significantly over the coming decades because uh, the net zero transition is not going away and it's only going to become more imperative and so you look at things like energy trading you know improving the efficiency of that which is 
again, the most technical element of the TCA you can imagine, the most boring thing which will send the average voter to sleep. But if you don't actually resolve that in terms of the single day auctions, whatever they're called for trading electricity under the channel, you're adding potentially a quarter of a billion to the uh, cost of trading your energy with the continent. The more you want to build interconnectors to boost your capacity in, in face of the threat from Russia, the more those costs uh, build on top of themselves. And the same goes with climate when you have uh, the EU in introducing its carbon border tax, which is to make sure that its businesses which are paying carbon tariffs aren't uh, sort of being undercut by imports coming in from countries where they don't impose that stringent regulation. So if you don't keep up over time, these things are going to get worse and worse and worse. And so you need to anticipate now. And yeah, I would say that that carbon and energy stuff is really where um, it could bite if there's not greater coordination. Janneke, did you want to, I don't know if you're putting your hand up there. Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, I just wanted to add something to uh, what Joel just said. Uh, so I agree that it's important to kind of anticipate how external circumstances could change over the next few years. And I think there are a few factors there. Um, one is the US election next year. Uh, so we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but there might be an incentive uh, for the EU and the UK to, to cooperate more closely on certain issues um, when it comes to geopolitics and security and so on. Uh, climate change is another one where um, external developments could mean that closer cooperation is required. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine, we don't know how that's going to unfold. Um, so I think there are external factors that come into play over the next few years. And probably other than uh, energy and climate, foreign security and defense uh, is, is an area where I think closer cooperation would be in the mutual interest. Um, and it might be easier achievable than in the kind of trade easement um, area. So, Anand, you said you don't know <laughs> you don't know what the benefit of a formal agreement would be on foreign and security policy. Um, I guess the fact is that over the past couple of years or so, the EU uh, initiated lots of structured structure dialogues uh, on foreign and security policy uh, with most of its neighbours. So the EU now has a structured um, dialogue with the US, with Norway, with Iceland, and the UK kind of stands out as the only one where the EU doesn't have that sort of format, where you come together at political leaders level uh, to discuss important issues. Um, the EU also has a sanctions dialogue with the US, for example, on enforcement um, of sanctions. Um, and the UK actually also has its own dialogue uh, with the US, but the EU and the UK don't have that sort of dialogue. Uh, so I think there are lots of areas where it just, it just probably seems slightly odd that those formats don't exist between the EU and the UK, uh, where they um, exist between lots of other countries and the EU or other countries and the UK. So I think that's probably an obvious area to look at also given kind of what we anticipate is going to happen in the world around us in the next two years. And um, if you look at the political declaration, so that document that the EU and the UK signed mm -hmm. in 2019 um, with kind of a vision for how the relationship could unfold, there's lots of stuff in there um, on foreign and security policy that didn't make it into the TCA. Um, so we can assume that those are things that the EU would theoretically be interested in. Um, some of it is, is relates to kind of Tesco, so the, the permanent uh, structured corporation. We know that the UK now joined one of those uh, projects, the project on military mobility, but there are others they could look at. Um, there could be an arrangement uh, with the European Defence Agency um, that was foreseen by the political declaration. So I think the pol political declaration is probably quite a useful starting point if you want to think about, well, what was the EU actually interested in terms of cooperation with the UK that didn't make it into the TCA and therefore we can assume that those are areas that are a good starting point for, for conversation. Okay, we can argue that as well. I also think one of the things to reflect on, Yannick, I agree with you, is think about the debate on AI regulation over the last couple of years and that's a really good example whereby both America and the EU have taken a much more, uh, I would argue, sensible approach because they've recognised, frankly, we failed with social media before to understand about regulation and we've got the behemoth that we now have. And so the UK trying to go it alone, actually, is pretty limited 
because of the size of the two alternatives and the ways in which they are working. And that wasn't something that was particularly envisaged when the political agreement came up. The other thing I'll say is in terms of what everyone's saying is that we all have to recognise the UK's economy had problems way before Brexit happened and that there have been problems like the pandemic, like the war in Ukraine that have affected many of us. But Brexit is our only homegrown challenge. So it is the one politically and kind of policy wise we could probably do the most about because it is the one that we created. Um, I would challenge Joel on boring that I think the Pan-European Mediterranean Convention, if you ever want to deal with insomnia, is a good way to start. But there's also issues around the standards regime with all of these things like Moldova. Moldova has access to the single market in a limited fashion. These are all potential issues where we could make progress if we are prepared to collaborate. What we haven't done before as a nation is set out where we're prepared to collaborate, and we haven't done that for six or seven years. And what I think you're seeing today is a willingness to talk about what collaboration could be possible, whilst also having that conversation with the British public about the consequences of not collaborating and the further isolation. And just finally, yeah. on your point about what else is Europe interested in, I would go back to this issue about the rise of the far right. I think there is a benefit politically to looking to an access where if you've got an incoming centre-left progressive government to offer some kind of bulwark against, you know, I am very worried by the rise of the far right across Europe. I'm worried about the AFD and what they're doing. I'm worried about what's happening in um, Switzerland. I'm worried about France. I'm worried about Maloney and where she might take things. And actually, there is an interest, I think, in Europe as well about, well, if you had a sensible grown-up government that wanted to do business, what also political impact on those wider challenges, which are about defence and security and on the kind of world we live in, could the UK bring to our conversations? So, I mean, leaving defence and security to one side for a moment, we've got a number of questions from people along the same theme. Ian Clark perhaps puts it best, which is, what if the EU are happy with the way things are? I mean, what if, you know, what if the state, we, we, we keep talking about mutual benefit and stuff like that. I could almost see it in security, though I'm yet to be persuaded on security. But on the economics, the EU have got a pretty good deal with the TCA. Uh, they've got a lot of other sort of issues to be dealing with at the moment, whether it's migration or the, the other things we've talked about. Why, why the hell would they want to waste time? negotiating new economic arrangements with us? What if the status quo suits them well? This is disappointing. I can come in if you want. Yeah, go on, dig me out of this hole. Okay, yeah. Um, I think that's that's uh, like is probably the key question to raise is how you bring the EU to um, the negotiating table. And so this is kind of, you know, the, the core of what we're putting across in the report really is, um, kind of uh, there's an element of trust, which I already um, kind of spoke about, but there's also the point of incentive and you need to think about what is the EU um, gonna get out of this. Um, and so probably the main thing as, you know, and then put it sort of middle-class European students coming to study at the LSE or wherever, like that is one of probably, you know, the biggest- Let's talk about the LSE at our events. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's because we're a more sort of the earth king's colony. Yeah, um, so that's that's probably where you're, you, you know, have the most to potentially entice the EU with. And Erasmus is is another part of that because again, it's um, it's sort of funded study places to come and live in the UK. And I think the kind of the corollary corollary of that is the um, the kind of the the cultural connection which does still exist. And it's easy to say that the UK is now just another third country, but it's not quite just another third country within the European Union. Um, they still have a working group on the UK, which is a relic of the negotiations that meets twice a week. Uh, that doesn't really happen with other third countries. And there is this sense like that there is something that has been lost there. Again, Europeans used to have the ability to come and work here, um, study here, and that that is kind of felt that that's no longer there. And yes, if it's a trade deal with New Zealand, you might say, okay, every member state, go away, individually negotiate your terms of access on mobility. That's fine because New Zealand is... The furthest country in the world away from us and realistically you know there's not that strong connection there are still those bridges there for the uk and so i think that's if you're thinking about as a, as a government how you try and approach negotiation i think you have to play on those sensitivities those existing kind of links and kind of bring them back and that's still going to take a lot lot more work and i tend to agree that i think the incentives of the eu remain 
quite low, but that's probably your your starting point in answering the question, even though I don't think it's a sufficient answer to the, the challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's, let me the neighborhood point. it's the neighbourhood point, isn't it? I mean, you know, London is still the most diverse in European term city in Europe. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, I think it's wrong to say, actually, you know, there's a kind of commission narrative, which is there because it's easy and defensive. It's always been the way with the EU. It's the kind of highest, what I call highest common denominator negotiating, where it's just easy to remain in a defensive position. And and if the UK gives them no reasons to, to, do, to, to change that position, then fine, it won't change, line of least resistance. But as the border comes back in, and as a new government take shape actually joel's right that you know the europe you, you know uk is not a third uh, you know it's it's a unique third country in its size and proximity to the eu relative to it to its overall power and it it, it can i think re-engage europe that doesn't mean starmer rides into town and gets everything he wants but i think it's it's just too easy to say why would the eu bother right I don't I just think that that, you know, that is too far in the other direction and not actually recognizing that actually the EU would want to engage and should want to engage with a UK that's not, you know, in full headbanging mode, which it has been for the last seven years. OK, so let me. Yeah, I think I, I, you know, at the risk of suggesting that, you know, why do you hate Britain? And that, I, mean, I think we do have something to offer. Uh, and I don't think it is just about the history and the cultural ties. I think also if you think about the challenges, say not just the rise of the far right, some of the challenges economically people are coping with, uh, security, climate change. Migration is a good example where actually no country will be able to resolve this on their own. There has to be cooperation. And the last thing you want as the European Union is a country on the edges that can exert a negative pull. So I think there is... There is plenty that we can find common agreement about. I just think we have to recognise how badly we've messed up our ability to be trusted to have those conversations as a starting point. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people in Europe interested in what could be done. I think I, think, I don't think we should be so pessimistic that we're kind of millwall. I just think we need to be more open and honest about the fact that it is going to be a, a long journey to get the attention of people. So we need to make it count. Just to say, Millwall lost 3-0 at home at the weekend. But uh, I've got a question here from Alan Wager, formerly of this manner, I believe. And this rephrases the question quite nicely. If you were Starmer today, going into the Elysee, what would you say to President Macron to persuade him that actually we should be able to open a pretty broad-ranging negotiation with him and the European Union? I mean, what, what would the sort of elevator pitch be? So you're all proving me right here. No, we're all being far too British and polite about who should go first. That's. Do I have to nominate? <laughs> yeah, go and pick someone. Peter. <laughs> of course. Right. So I think I think what you have to do is is I mean I'm going to repeat myself here, but you have to say that you are intent. Right. Macron's a politician. He knows he knows where. Um, he knows where, where, where the political realities are in the UK. I think you have to say to Macron that you want to draw a line under the uh, um, last seven years and that you intend to do things that demonstrate that the commitment is more than warm words. And I think that you talk about I mean, you know, we talked about defence and security. That's not a quid pro quo for trade access, by the way. But the stuff you could do jointly on Ukraine support, Ukraine rebuilding, um, you know, contributions to uh, security in the Balkans to start with. Then I think you get behind your uh, uh, Macron's EPC and you start to, you know, broaden out that gathering and get into some of the things he was saying about concentric circles you know, Europe after Ukrainian accession. Then I think you get into uh, um, energy security and energy connectors. You get into um, nuclear power. You get into uh, uh, ETS linkage, carbon linkage, and, and a shared commitment on carbon. You then, I mean, you know, I don't think that discussion is actually that material. And no one is saying, you know, that Mr. Macron is going to go, well, great, I'll go and fix all that with the commission. 
That isn't how it works. And Yannick is right that, you know, the Labour Party needs to pay more attention to what's going on in Brussels and get build more relations in 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 um, in in Brussels. But as an opening pitch, right, and obviously all of that depends on, uh, frankly, what sort of majority yeah. Starmer gets at the next election, truthfully. But, you know, what's the alternative? I go back to what's the alternative? And, you know, the EU can sit on their hands, but ultimately, if the UK is prepared to put beef on the table, if it's prepared to join programmes, it's prepared to um, fix youth mobility issues in a way that isn't about taking advantage of Europe's young people, all of that stuff, why not? Right? You know, by definition, they hold all the cards. They always have. It's not as though they're going to you know, find themselves with the UK. I think we've, we've learned that over the last seven years. The UK is suddenly going to run rings around them. But at some level, you have to change the framing of the negotiation, which has been zero sum and adversarial from the get go. And that was inevitable. The referendum was conceived in British political enmity after 30 years of negative narratives on, on Europe. And by the way, they're all still there. Front page of the Telegraph and the Mail, when Starmer goes to um, Starmer goes to The Hague, plot to let in EU migrants. I mean, what's incredible is just how embedded those narratives are. And if this whole thing runs into the sand, it will be partly because over the last four or five years, the Labour Party's done absolutely nothing to challenge them. You know, um, you know, the one hand they deride Boris Johnson's thin Brexit deal. But, you know, I can tell you as a reporter trying to get find a Labour person to comment prominently, prominently on the downsides of those of the consequences of that deal is incredibly hard going. And so there's been no pitch rolling. Nice to see it starting now, but you have to start somewhere. There you go. That's my pitch. That was a very long elevator ride, I have to say. Anyone else want to? I mean, yeah, I might not put beef, but I might put fish on the table because there are plenty of examples where actually for France and for the UK showing that a better relationship, a more grown up relationship would be stronger. Um, I'll take Peter's challenge. As I say, it has been a lonely furrow. Maybe I've not been shouting loud enough, Peter, but I think there is a lot of interest. We are growing as I mean, there's a lot of people who want to talk about what would be possible and recognise this is not about 2016 or 2019. It is about what can be done at the key points of negotiation, but also what is happening now and in the future, whether it is AI, whether it is changes in the climate crisis, whether it is destability in our political processes. Actually, we do all share more in common than people think. And that new relationship is something that across the public people support. You know, the public have moved on. I think the challenge that Peter's articulating is that the politicians maybe need to do so as well. And at that point, I shall, I'm afraid, and take John, John Curtis to go and continue out. to be able to do that. You've been on an exception, you. Stella. John Curtis points out 70% of people who say they'll vote Labour at the next election are pro-EU, identify themselves as pro-EU. So after the election, Starmer's going to find himself with a party and electorate that are much more pro-EU. And I think we've seen with the Windsor framework that when you actually kind of beard this beast, it turns out to be not nearly as terrifying as as uh, as as you might think. Okay, Stella, did you have to do you have to go at this point? <laughs> I, I do, I'm afraid. Uh, Thank but you very, I am very, very much. happy if people are interested in what we're doing in the Labour Europe on all of these issues and they are suffering from insomnia and want to know about the pan European Mediterranean Convention. Um, we're more than happy to talk. And thank you for inviting me. And also thank you to Yannick and Joel for all their work because, as I say, the fact that people are setting out the challenges ahead is a step forward from where we were a year ago when nobody would even talk about the fact that there were challenges ahead. Um, but that was also when we had Liz Truss as Prime Minister, and it just seems a world away now, doesn't it? Thank you so much, Stella. I mean, we've almost run out of time, but I mean, Joel and Yannicka, if either of you have any closing remarks, you're welcome at this point. We should give you the last word. Um, I just very flippantly wanted to say to, to Alan's question that um, I think no matter how convincing your elevator pitch to Macron, I don't think um, this is really the most important person to talk to when it comes to the TCA review, because by the time the re review comes around, Macron will don't be tell him that. He will be on his way out, probably, uh, with presidential elections in 2027. Um, and yes, France is an influential member state, of course, 
But at the end of the day, there are 27 member states who will all have to agree to any changes that will be made to the TCA, particularly if you want to build on it, if you want to add new agreements to it, um, which will have to be negotiated by the Commission on behalf of all member states. So you kind of have to think about, well, what is in the collective interest of all EU member states mm. and EU institutions and not just one member state? And I think that's maybe also a bit one of the things that we saw during uh, the Brexit negotiations, that there was this thinking on the UK side, oh, if we only convince the Germans, then, you know, it will be fine. But um, I think, yeah, there has to be kind of an acknowledgement that this has to work for all EU member states. Yeah, Alan, sort yourself out. Joel. Yeah, I weirdly, um, yeah, I totally agree with Janneke. I was sort of similarly going to sort of dunk on Alan for focusing on the wrong uh, target um, a red. I would disagree with with Alan, but um, I think yeah, kind of what I would just add to Yannicka's point is I think it's more prosaic. It's not really about you know here's the three things you in the EU want. It's more about showing that you understand the EU and how it works and how it thinks. And it's about that kind of yeah slightly softer kind of reflection that you're a serious partner. I think sort of historically Britain has had a bit of a challenge with doing that. I think um, Tony Blair kind of similar things, slightly kind of uh, messianic approach towards how you run your kind of European foreign policy as well, potentially. And you kind of need to show, I think, that you've got a bit more focused in on the granular stuff and you start there before you build out. So it's things like saying, OK, we understand SPS agreement. Your biosecurity area is really, really important to you. We're going to do X, Y, and Z to guarantee that we're not going to let infected chicken come into your uh, territory and so forth. And it's that kind of, it's the policy stuff, it's the detail, it's the technique. I think that's where you begin to build up your trust slowly rather than going in straight at the top and saying, you know, here's what you, you know, want to talk about on security. It's just that, yeah, little details. Brilliant. Thank you. We've overrun, as I always tend to do. But uh, before we go, let me just thank Peter in particular and Stella, who's now gone for taking the time. The link for Peter's book is at the top of the Slido. It is well worth a read because uh, the analysis of what's been happening since Brexit is really spot on and very, very detailed. Uh, as I said right at the start, we've got our event with Michael Heseltine tomorrow. For those of you who want to join online, I do get the sense from this conversation that the Brexit debate is entering a new phase. Uh, I'm not sure Brexit is entering a new phase itself, but the conversation about it, I think, is is changing. And it's quite interesting to see how it's changing. I still think Peter's absolutely wrong, of course, but there we go. That's never going to change. Uh, but for the moment, until our next event, thank you all for tuning in. And we hope to see you soon at future UK and a Changing Europe events. Thank you.